can see that the measure is reasonably well with this non adiabatic direction, uh, where the coefficient is you know, roughly a order of one. This four is, because we have four, four of And what it turns into is if you Fourier transform this, is that the line shape for the surface peak, so this is a theoretical calculation, uh, gets kind of smushed over towards low frequency. So it's not a sharp Lorentzian line shape like you would expect from normal quantum oscillations, but it's very asymmetric. And indeed, that's, that's what they see in the, in the data. Uh, and it agrees remarkably well with this kind of shape you expect here. And I, I want to comment that you can also get strange line shapes from the precursors to spin splitting, places for a conventional or a topological insulator like surface. But actually, these have the wrong uh, sign of correction. Those, those would bend up in this plot. And they would also, the magnitude is unphysically large. It would require some huge factors, you know, several hundred. Uh, and also, it wouldn't produce this kind of sharply asymmetric line shape, because you would roughly have uh, the two, two frequencies, one for the spin up and one for the spin down. And kind of pull the peak apart as you would a higher field. So that would be a more symmetric problem. All right, so there's a lot of information. So let me just summarize what's seen and what's not seen in, in these type of archive microstructures uh, relative to what we expect. So we treat the surface component of the quantum oscillations only in thin films, which is consistent with these uh, kind of orbits that require going through the bulk. And there's some reasonable agreement with the theoretical uh, dependence on disorder and and what's observed. What the um, the more the interesting observation is that the oscillations seem to require parallel surfaces. So having surfaces that are at an angle with each other uh, kill the oscillation. The system with the phase being dependent on the, uh, the length of the, the fault. Uh, another thing, uh, if you remember, we predicted that if you go to too large a field, there's a, a field at which the quantum oscillations stop. This is actually not observed on, over the field range uh, that's accessible right now. Uh, and if you do kind of back of the envelope estimate, you expect these saturation fields to be few Tesla. Uh, so it's a little troublesome, but it's, it's, it's possible that the, in the, you know, they're kind of lurking just beyond the, the field range probe. Uh, but this is something you know, that's that we need for this study. But there's also clearly a surface phase based on the angle dependence. Um, and in the first part of my talk, I, I mentioned that if you look at carefully at the angle dependence of these peaks, you can actually back off the fact that there, there's a thickness dependency. It's really kind of like a way to measure this topological connection of surface and bulk. So unfortunately, doing this is, is kind of complicated in this setup. And the reason is, well, there's several reasons. The first is that um, its surface and the bulk contributions come at very similar frequencies. So in the real space positions of these peaks are kind of all on top of each other. So, it, and the other thing is that this uh, line shape of the surface component kind of bleeds into the bulk. So it's hard to kind of disentangle them. So we're unable to cleanly distinguish them at this time. So basically, the error bars in the position of the peak is larger than their separation. Okay, so maybe let me just skip this summary slide and finish with just a brief advertisement. Uh, so, so far I've been talking about magnetic signatures of, of this topological features in, this, in while interact semi metals. Uh, but there is also uh, high, high field measurements provide a simple kind of way to diagnose a wild semi metal. And the reason is that. Uh, so here, looking at uh, torque magnetometry measurements, basically a measurement of magnetization, or rather magnetization anisotropy. And the so wild electrons are kind of special in that you have this lowest chiral Landau level. And so as I crank up the field, if I start with some finite doping, uh, all the states are increasingly piled into this lowest Landau level. So the energy of the conduction states are actually decreasing as I crank up the magnetic field, which gives me a paramagnetic response the magnetic field. Uh, and once I'm in this quantum limit, the energy stops depending on field, because this lowest Landau level doesn't depend on field. 
And then what's left is any residual diamagnetism from these valence bands or from some of these materials that have kind of conduction, uh, massive conduction pockets also. So what you'd expect in torque for the wild semi metal is a big reversal in torque. Right, first you have this paramagnetic thing, and then when you reach the quantum limit, it kind of turns around and you just get some uh, diamagnetism from the background. Whereas for conventional electrons, you expect it to kind of go up and maybe dressed by some quantum oscillations and just get diamagnetism the whole way. And indeed, in, if you measure this in naive Mars and I, which is one of these wild candidates, uh, you see exactly this kind of torque reversal. So this may be a, a simple uh, symptom to diagnose a wild thing at all. Alright, so thanks a lot for your attention. Questions? Uh, this might not be completely fair, uh, it might be more appropriate for your experimental uh, colleagues, but uh, a couple of times you mentioned uh, how clean the surfaces were from the focused ion beam, and I was wondering a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, how, how, how was that quantified? And secondly, uh, kind of what's at stake, uh, how sensitive are these sorts of effects to, uh, you know, weak disorder that's almost certainly at the surface, uh, you know, even if these other. Right, right. So, I, I have a kind of indirect answer, which is that since you're seeing some surface component of the quantum oscillation, you know that at least a portion of the orbit that's on the surface is clean enough that you can complete it without scattering. And so, because you see these nice clean quantum oscillations, it's indicative of having a very clean surface. Um, so, yeah, okay. It's hard to extract, say, what exactly the transport, what's the mean free path of the surface since the bulk is also conducting. But I think there's a really good sign that the surfaces are morally clean in the sense of cyclotron frequency times the scattering rate is large at a few tesla. I was just I was curious if your collaborators had done some sort of uh, <coughs> some sort of characterization of the surfaces. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, I believe they have, but I really I can't speak to the I mean they know how thick the ion implantation layers are and things like that. So. A question. So, a bit of a difficulty in understanding when you tilt the field, how does this bulk transport work? Because it seems that once you tilt the field, the real space, electron, and an angle. Yeah, precisely. So, does that uh, affect uh, the outcome? Yeah, so, um, so the chiral lambda level goes along the magnetic field, just like you said. So if I tilt the field rail to the surface, it has to go further through the bulk. Uh, and so actually you expect the scattering to, to become more and more detrimental the longer you, you make this orbit. And indeed actually they see that as they tilt the uh, surface, the amplitude, so the magnetic field, the amplitude of the surface oscillation dies pretty quickly. Um, so it's only ob observable within some, you know, 30 degrees of the top surface. So it's kind of consistent with what you would say. Other questions? Uh, just to get a clarification about what the charge of the frequency of the frequency is going to be in the foundation. That's like the right at the wild point of the fault. There's always arc, arc lengths over, oh, sorry, the frequency in the magnetic field. Yeah, in the magnetic field. Yeah, it's basically the area difference between the zero doping and whatever doping you're at of this arc length. What happens at zero doping then? Yeah, so at zero doping, everything's particle hole symmetric, so if you adjust the magnetic field, the length, the lambda levels move away from the chemical potential, and they never cross the chemical potential. And so you won't see this quantum oscillation. You still have these orbits, but they're just moving away from here symmetrically in the particle hole symmetric fashion. So you need levels that keep crossing your chemical potential to see this point. So you need some finite doping. Any other questions? In direct semi-metals, which for me are, there are two close orbits that can form one.